Hello friends and welcome back to another episode of The Seeking Kind. I'm your host Kylie and I'm so excited that you decided to press play today. Today is a very special day because it's actually our first episode and I am just over the moon excited. I have been dreaming about this day and planning for this day for a very long time and I just can't believe it's finally here. I know that My initial goal was to put this out on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, but I'm actually just going to start with YouTube for now until I kind of get the hang of it, and then we'll be transitioning over to Apple and Spotify. So thanks for pressing play on YouTube. I know it's a little inconvenient and not how we normally listen to our podcast, but I so appreciate your support, and truly your support um, means the world to me. So just thanks again. Before I really get into content today, I wanted to take a few minutes and just dedicate this episode to vision casting and just kind of explaining a little bit about my heart behind the podcast and what I hope that you get out of it and help you know if you want to want to press play again, which I really hope you do, um, but totally understand that this might not be for everyone. So I have been toying with the idea of starting this podcast for the better part of a year, and there's been a lot of ways that the Lord has really nudged me and urged me to start it, and that's come in the form of friends asking me to start one and random books that I bought at farmer's markets having literally direct lines that say, some of you God has called to start a podcast, or there's been sermons where the pastors have said like, I feel like I'm just speaking to someone in this room. I feel like I'm I feel like God is telling you to start a podcast and you really should start it. And so I felt like kind of last month, like I got to this place where I just couldn't ignore the urges anymore and I just needed to really start it. And so my vision for the podcast is one um, of authenticity and really just yeah, I think authenticity is the best way to describe it. Like we can dive into topics that people aren't covering and it goes beyond just like the traditionally controversial topics, right? Like we can think about things or have things come up and we can say like, we've been thinking and believing these things for so long. Like what are the basis of those thoughts? And that we can, this can be a place that's grounded in truth and also grounded in the word and that we can have respectful conversations and dialogues about why we believe the things that we do and that we can just explore concepts that I believe Christian influencers and Christian churches in America today aren't covering. So like I mentioned, I kind of wanted to take a moment in this episode and really just share my testimony. And it's not going to be the whole thing because it's really dense. It's, um, It's a super dense testimony, but it is one of resilience and it's one of glory and it's one where the Lord has just really redeemed me and sustained me over and over again. And so I really want to give it the time that it deserves. So let's take it back all the way to 2003. Baby Kylie is born. I was born in Indianapolis, Indiana, which is a whole nother ball game. And I was born a pastor's kid. So for those of you who don't know what it's like to be a pastor's kid, that will be a whole nother episode in and of itself because that is totally a subculture and it's pretty hard to boil down to a few sentences. It really is a lifestyle, it's a subculture, and it can be a great thing, but it can also be really harmful. And so I'd love to talk about that more. But I was born a pastor's kid and when you are a PK, it's like you live in a fishbowl and you are living for the view and approval of your church. And especially when you are the lead pastor's kid, it's really kind of next level. And so I think I also have a different take because I was the lead pastor's daughter. And I believe that being a daughter in a church is very different from being a son. From my experience, daughters in churches have a whole another set of responsibilities than sons. And so I very much felt the pressure of holding my family together. And I very much felt the responsibility of having it all together, knowing all the answers, being the caretaker, being gentle, quiet, and well-behaved. And I very much felt that when things weren't going well in my family or in my church, it was my job to fix it. And so I think that when you come into the church with these notions of it's your job to fix and it's your job to sustain an image, I think that can be really, really harmful. And so that in and of itself is a lot for a kid, right? It's a lot for anyone to deal with. And I was born into that, so I didn't know anything else. I didn't know that 
this is not how every kid grows up this is not necessarily normal and my parents had two other kids so i'm also the oldest so i'm feeling the responsibility of kind of holding my family together while also taking care of my younger siblings and my parents got married at 19 and 23 so already that's the model that i have for marriage like you get married young you start having kids you serve you work in the church like you do all of these things and that was just so normal for me and once you kind of take a step back you're like getting married at 19 is not normal like it used to be it totally did but now it's like that's just kind of like unheard of but that was my model growing up and like marriage and child rearing and being a godly wife and being a godly husband like that was a lot of what I was taught both at home and in the church and so I think that my entire world just came crashing down and absolutely crumbled uh, when my parents got divorced. So I actually remember after my parents told me they were getting divorced I remember the next day going to my fifth grade classroom and I sat down and I remember I sat down next to this girl named Brianna and I remember just looking at her and saying my parents are getting divorced and she kind of looked at me and she just goes oh mine are already divorced and i remember being like laughing and being confused and just being like what is this life like it was almost this mindset shift of like i'm no longer in the church like i am now worldly i am now like not the type of kid that I used to be and I think that's when I realized that my world and my life were going to be completely different and I just felt like everything that I had been taught in the church and at home about marriage and kids and families and maintaining an image like I really just felt like all of that came crumbling down and it kind of broke me to the point of where I felt like I have no idea who I am anymore. Like, I have no idea what's coming next. I have no idea where I'm going to live. All I know is that my parents are constantly fighting. My dad is kicking things. My mom is crying. Um, I'm now responsible for my brothers. Like, my youngest brother was three at the time. And it just very much felt like when you're at dad's house, you're the caretaker. And when you're at mom's house, you're trying to make sure mom is okay. And you are now responsible for not only your brothers but you're responsible for everyone else's emotions and you're expected to hold it all together and when you can't hold it all together there's not really support like i remember i would be crying and my mom would be crying and then i would cry to my dad and it was like there's not really support there and my brothers are just little and i just remember feeling so confused and my relationship with my dad was really fractured. It was super strained and kind of coupled with the divorce and also just with how broken my relationship with my dad was, I really started having a lot of mental health problems. And I remember trying to tease out like, how do I process the abuse and the harm and the violence that I'm seeing with my own emotions? And how do I how do I navigate this new world that I'm expected to live in? Like everything changed so quickly and so radically. And I remember just being like, I am completely lost. And these mental health challenges actually led to a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression, and they actually led to suicidal ideation. And I remember I was 12 and I used to keep knives under my bed um, so that I could cut my wrists. And I always thought, like, this is how I'm going to die one day. Like, one day, mom or dad's going to come upstairs or come into my room. And I'm not going to be here anymore. And when I think about that, and I think about how broken I was, and I picture that little girl laying on the floor of her bedroom, had this blue comforter, and I would lay under the box spring of my bed and I would cut my wrist and I could see the blue comforter hanging off the side of the bed and when I think about her I just want to hug her and I want to just grab her shoulders and say listen everything's gonna be okay because the thing was that no one else knew 
I, I wasn't doing it in a way for attention. I wasn't doing it to leave marks or scars. I wasn't even bleeding most of the time. I was just doing it to feel something and to feel in control and to feel like this is one thing in my life right now that I can control. And I think from the outside looking in, a lot of people just thought, oh, her parents are getting divorced. That's so sad. But when you think about all the notions, the preconceived notions that I was taught for so long about marriage and the church and how God hates divorce and God hates this and, you know, all of those things, all those expectations that I felt, it's like, of course my world came crashing down. Of course it did. And when I think about that now, really what comes to mind is just how God has absolutely transformed my mental health. The way that I no longer walk in that, I'm just blown away by his goodness. I'm blown away by his tenderness and by the fact that when no one else was there, he was there. Even when I didn't feel his presence, he was there. So I'm still navigating my parents' divorce, right? That was really at the start of middle school. And from at this point, we had moved from Arizona back to San Diego. So my dad's in the military and he got orders to Camp Pendleton. So we kind of transitioned out of Arizona and back to San Diego. So I finish middle school and I start high school and complete high school in San Diego. And throughout this time, I really walked away from God. And what I just previously mentioned about how he was always there, that was not something that I recognized. I, I thought he had abandoned me truly. And so I never knew that God was there with me in all of those moments. I just thought that I was alone. I thought that I was struggling alone and no one knew. And so I felt very lonely. I felt very isolated. And it wasn't, it, it truly wasn't until like two years ago, I'd say, um, that I realized when I was 12, God was there. When I was 13, God was there. When I was suicidal, God was there. Every single time he was there, but it really took me stepping back and realizing that, um, honestly, recently. So back to my story, let's kind of find ourselves in this timeline. So end of middle school, start of high school, I've really walked away from God. And this was a huge deal in my family. My grandma has always been just an absolute pillar of our faith, right? She's like the matriarch. She's an absolute role model for us. And I remember one day we were visiting her and she we were sitting at dinner and she was like oh do you kylie do you want to pray and i remember saying like kind of offhandedly like oh i don't believe in god anymore and the look on her face oh my gosh if looks could kill um she kind of just gave me this look and i remember thinking like oh shoot like my family my family always says like that's something you should have kept in your head and so i was like that's something i should have kept in my head like i should not have brought that up and so I tried to kind of dig myself out of that one. And I was like, I mean, it's not that I don't believe in God. It's just that I'm not sure. But in my heart, I knew that I really didn't believe in God anymore. And like, it was either that night or like a few days later, my mom was like, hey, like pops, like your grandpa called me and like Nana is really concerned and she's really worked up over the fact that you don't believe in God anymore. Like, do you still believe? And I was like, mom, honestly, like, I don't know. Like, this is a really hard time for me and I'm not sure. And I really stepped into a lot of things that looking back now, I was searching for purpose and I was searching for fulfillment and I was also searching for stability. And so I turned to a lot of things that I thought would give me those, um, those goals that I wanted and they didn't. And I remember just feeling like I am doing so much. Why am I not feeling fulfilled why am i still feeling confused and angry and depressed and it's because i wasn't pressing into god like i i left him and i thought that he had left me and so i checked out and i actually got super into crystals and horoscopes and zodiac signs and uh, like i i went for it like i was like well if i don't have god and my family's a mess like maybe these crystals will help me with my anxiety maybe these horoscopes on snapchat will tell me how my week is gonna go and it was to the point where like i remember one time there was a full moon and i like sat out or it was like an eclipse and i sat outside like with all my crystals in the grass and i was like 
okay, like this is gonna help me, like the crystals are absorbing the energy and it's gonna help me and I'll keep them on my desk and I'll sleep with them and like I'll hold them and I'll rub them certain ways and like it'll heal me. And I really did put my faith in those things. Like I honestly did. And for years, for years, I battled anxiety and I battled depression. And and here's the thing, like I never want my story to come across as like, oh, like mental health, just pray pray it away. Like, like if you just pray hard enough, God will heal your anxiety. Or like if he hasn't healed your anxiety, it's because you're not praying enough. Like, absolutely not. I I don't believe that we serve a God who just, I don't believe we serve a God of quid pro quos. Like, oh, if God, if I do this for you, then you'll do this for me. Absolutely not. It was a journey. But I can say, like, God does heal mental health. He does. And I used to be one of those people that would say, oh, God can heal mental health, but he's not going to do it for me. He's not. Like, I have a chemical imbalance, or it's genetic, or it's this, or it's that. And yes, all of those things are true. And mental health disorders can be genetic and you can have chemical imbalances. But I believe that we serve a God that is greater than those things. And so I I was just a firm believer that like he wasn't going to heal my mental health. And the Lord really had to break that in me. And so this was years down the line. I ended up getting off my medication like my freshman year of college. Um, but... I really just had to decide like God can heal me from this and I think that when you decide that you're going to step into the presence of the healer and you're going to believe in faith that he is still a healer I think he does big big things and so I through all of this like he has really showed me that he answers prayers when i'm obedient and so i feel like in this time in my life he was probably pressing on my heart and trying to tell me like kylie get rid of the crystals get rid of the worldly things that you're putting your faith in and run back to your father and put your faith in me because i'm the only thing that can sustain you and i think when i made that mindset shift of like i cannot do this on my own anymore like i am constantly exhausted i am constantly worn out I'm tired of playing mental gymnastics in my head all day long from my anxiety. Like, I'm going to have to press into God. I think that when I finally made that choice, he starts to answer. And he answers immediately. And it wasn't like the next day I woke up and, oh, I'm quitting my antidepressants. No, no, no. But it was like day by day, it's starting to get better. And I, I think it was like three weeks after I kind of made that mindset shift. I went to my doctor and I was like, hey, I want to get off my, my antidepressants. Like... I don't think I need them anymore like I think I'm good and I think that that is just such a testimony to the God we serve and the power that he holds but in the same vein like don't ask him to do things in your life if you're not ready for him to actually show up right like I wasn't necessarily ready for him to show up yet I wasn't ready for him to heal me of my anxiety but once I was I think that's when he moves and that goes back to the whole conversation about authenticity that we started at the beginning it's like if you're not ready to walk in the freedom that christ is offering then don't ask him for it and don't expect him to give it to you if you're not ready like your heart has to be soft your heart has to be tender and you have to genuinely want him to show up in these ways and there's been so many examples in my life where i'll say like oh god like i'm praying for this i'm praying for this but it's in my heart i know that i'm not in that place yet and so i really think that not only is this a testament of the healing god that we serve but it also is just a testament to how he honors and how he values our authenticity and how he knows and he works when your heart is ready and your heart is pure and so let's kind of take it back to the story a bit so I graduate high school and I move up to San Luis Obispo for college so kind of towards the end of high school like my first year in college is when I started to find God again and I move up to San Luis Obispo I'm five hours north of San Diego my hometown and I remember thinking that I wanted to find Christian community because at this point I had reconnected with God but I wasn't really a strong Christian I wasn't really walking the, the walk um, and I I, I would I have identified as a believer, but I still was kind of unsure. And so 
I move up to Cal Poly. I'm pursuing a degree in psychology and I'm actually a pre-med student. And so my whole life I had said, I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to be a physician. I'm following after my grandpa and this is just what I'm going to do. And my whole family knew that I wanted to be a doctor and we had just always talked about it. Like literally when I was bored, I would go on like the Lippman website and look at stethoscopes and think about how I was going to order myself a stethoscope when I graduated from med school. Like this was a dream that wasn't a dream for me. It was my reality. And I very much came into college with like an all or nothing mentality. Like you either become a physician or you fail. And so that in and of itself was a ton of pressure. And then I'm like, well, if you're saying you're a Christian, like you better find Christian community. And so I've I've tried to do that. I tried to go to Christian clubs. I tried to do all these things. And I felt like I was just constantly running into fake Christians. Like I was running into the stereotypical, like beautiful, blonde, skinny Christian girls. And they were all on the worship team and they all had Christian boyfriends and they had everything figured out. And their life was just perfect. And I I walked in like, I want Christian community, but not this type. Like, if this is what Christian community is, and I don't want it. Because I very much came into college like, where's the alcohol? Where's the guys? You know, where's my dream man? Like, I remember having conversations with my roommate about like, are we going to let guys sleep over? Like, all of those things. And I just wanted to experience it all. I wanted to do it all. And so I really found myself at this point of contention, like I wanted to draw near to the Lord, but I also wanted to be very worldly and I wanted to have that college experience. And so for the first half of my freshman year, I remember I would go to Bible studies and I would go to Christian clubs, but I was always the very cynical one and I was always had a ton of questions and very, very critical. And I remember one week we were like reading in Ephesians about godly wives and how the word says to submit to your husbands. I remember looking at Bible study leader and just being super nasty and being like, this is so misogynistic. Like, I hate this. I hate the concept that God gives us these rules, quote unquote. And I just want to do what I want. And I don't even, I remember telling her, I don't even understand what grace is. And I don't think you guys do either. I was like, give me a definition of grace because I don't know what that means. And I remember I a big thing for me is I was like constantly wanting to call people out and being like I see right through you like you are inauthentic and I remember like this was really before the Lord helped me work on gentleness and like the word says like gentle in spirit and humble in the way you correct people and the word gives us this model that is spirit and truth and it's grace and truth it's not just truth and i was really like just beating people with truth and being like you're wrong you're wrong the way you're living is wrong like i'm not going to look at myself but you're wrong and you're judgmental and you're stereotypical and blah 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 and so the lord really had to like take me on this journey of gentleness and like philippians 4 or 5 like let your gentleness be evident to all And this was a time where I look back, I was like, I was not walking in gentleness whatsoever, like whatsoever. And so it was super hard. I wasn't plugged into a church. And for those of you who are in college, you know, like your first year is super hard. You don't have a car. You are really reliant on people who can take you places. And so I do attribute that to why I wasn't plugged into a church, but it doesn't make it any easier, you know? So fast forward to my second year, I have my car and I start serving in the kids ministry at the church that I had been kind of going to. And I just started finding so much joy in that and so much fulfillment. And I started feeling like, okay, like this is my place. Like this is where I want to serve and I am feeling like this is my purpose. And so you know how like once you start serving in a church, you just start getting plugged in and you start recognizing things that make people's lives better. And I think the Lord, like as we pour out onto others, you know, the word talks about like you will be refreshed as you refresh others. And so I think as I started to pour out and plug in more, like a lot of times my heart wasn't even in it, but God started to do an inner working on me. And I think he started to break things in me that had been holding me hostage to sin. I think he started to reveal things to me like, you struggle with gentleness. 
You struggle with pride. You struggle with how you speak to people. You struggle with RBF. Like, all of these things that I kind of knew, but it's like now the Lord is revealing them to me. And I, I want to be better. Like, I want to work on them for Him. And so I got plugged into a life group. And I remember this was like the first time that I felt christian community that was real and authentic and i felt safe enough to ask questions and i felt validated in my faith and like every single week i was learning new things about god and i was learning new things about myself and it was just a really transformational time period and i will say like um i remember texting my friend hannah before every life group and being like i don't want to go and she'd be like, I don't want to go today either, but we're going to go and we're going to go together. And I'm just so grateful for that encouragement. And I'm so glad that she pushed me to go because it truly was transformational. And I had been praying for a Christian community. Like at this point, after I kind of got out of my freshman year funk and I really started serving in the church, I remember being like, God, like just give me Christian friends that I can hang out with on a multi-week basis. And after I got plugged into this life group, it was like every week, like hey girl, you want to do this? Or do you want to get coffee? Or do you want to study together? And I just remember being like, God, you are so good. You're so good. Like I prayed for Christian friends and now I have literally more than I can count. And we're all chasing after Jesus and we are in community and we're doing life together and it's safe. So let's kind of like reorient ourselves in this timeline. I know it's kind of all over the place and I'm sorry, but I'm doing the best I can. So we're, we're still kind of in like second year of college, right? And I've really come to know the Lord. And I'm starting to feel really strong in my faith. And I do believe that God speaks to me in dreams. And I believe that he gives me, sometimes I feel like he's almost like downloading things into me. I heard someone say that once and I really resonated with it. Like God will just download like vision and dreams in my heart and in my, in my mind. And so I had this dream one day where I was in a car and I was driving down a two-lane highway and I was just vibing. Like I was listening to my favorite artists and I was singing along and I was in like a convertible and the top was down and it was just awesome. And all of a sudden, I just went crashing off the highway. Like the highway ended and just plummeted into the ocean. And I remember like screaming and falling and being like, I'm going to die. Like this is how I'm going to die. And a hand reached down and grabbed the car and pulled the car back up onto the highway. And the hand was my mom's hand. And I, I recognized it immediately. I knew it was hers. And the, the hand put me back on the highway. And, and, and then the dream ended. But I'm assuming, you know, I was fine. Then I just kept going. And that dream will always just hold such a special place in my heart because that is the week that same week that i quit being pre-med and i talked about this at the beginning that was my dream forever and after i had that dream i i realized like i don't think that pre-med is something that i want to pursue like i think that god is calling me and wants me to be a psychologist he wants me to walk with my clients for years if i have to and to sit with them and hold space with them and not he doesn't want my healing to look like okay, we got a 15 minute appointment. Tell me your symptoms. Here's a prescription. Now get out. He didn't want that for me. And he does want that for others, but that's not what he wanted for me. That's he's not equipped me with those skills. He's equipped me with skills to sit with people and hold space and to remind them that they are seen and loved and validated by the creator of the universe. When I think about my journey to becoming a psychologist, I realized that it took all of these things, right? It took my struggles with mental health. It took moving around a ton and seeing different career options. It took my parents' divorce. It took everything to get to this moment where the Lord really said like, Kylie, this is where I'm calling you. This is what I'm asking you to do. And now like I'm sitting in my room and I'm recording this podcast and it's just so sweet. It's so sweet to see the way the Lord moves and the way that he honors obedience. And so I think just speaking on obedience starting this podcast i'm opening up doors for god to move and i really believe that i believe that i'm opening up a space for him to answer prayers prayers that i've been praying for years and prayers that i just started praying 
And there are so many things that I just can't wait to dive into and so many topics that I really want to discuss with you all. Um, and through all of this, I just want to remind you that our God is good and he's tenderhearted and he's faithful. He's faithful in providing all of your needs. That's evidence. That's evident in my own life, whether it was God help my parents stop fighting, God help me get into my dream school, or honestly, when I wake up, God just give me peace. And he has answered my prayers over and over, and for that I am just so grateful. I can't wait to cover topics that no one else wants to cover. We're talking about authenticity, right? Let's dive into the hard stuff. Let me share my thoughts with you guys. Let me um, let me use this space as a means of just being real and saying like, oh, no one else wants to touch that. Let's touch that one. Let's go there. Because how can we live in a world where we don't want to acknowledge topics that make us uncomfortable? Let's lean into that. Let's press into the discomfort because I think that there's so much wisdom when we name the things that are defeating us. There's wisdom that, that can be gained from that. And so I just can't wait to see the Lord, the way that the Lord will move. I believe he's still moving. I believe that God still answers prayers and that he still pursues us, that he still wants a relationship with us, even when we don't want a relationship with him. Even for all those years when I said, God, no, God, no, no, no. I'm going to press into crystals. I'm going to press into, are you serious? Snapchat horoscopes. Come on now. <laughs> I said no to him for years and he was just there knocking he's just like daughter when you're ready i'm here and so i just pray that you have that experience i i want to be transparent kind of as i wrap up my testimony and just say that like i do still struggle with things i used to struggle with i still have anxious thoughts i still overthink things i still go around the mountain over and over and over again and there are still pieces of my life in my heart that the lord is really putting his thumb on and saying like kylie i'm trying to work on this i'm trying to help you through this i'm trying to partner with you and refine your character but you have to let me you have to let him in and i really believe the lord is saying like you have to let me refine you so that you can reflect me and no matter how scary that is, I want to give him the chance. I want to allow him in so that he can cut out anything that doesn't look like him. So I don't want to come across as saying I have it all figured out or that I'm perfect because that's not true. And every time that I start to think like, oh, I'm doing pretty good in my walk with God, my prayer is instantly God humble me. God humble me because there are so many ways that I'm not walking with you and reveal that to me because if we don't think that we have problems or if we don't think that we're evil still, he can't move. He can't. And so we have to go low so that he can reveal in us what doesn't look like him and so that he can make us better. It's a lifelong process and we're never going to be there fully. So I really just want to say thanks so much for pressing play today. This is all that I have for this first episode, but I'm so incredibly grateful for your presence. Thanks for jumping on YouTube. I know that YouTube is not ideal, and I promise I'm working on getting this on other platforms, but I really just wanted to put this content out. It's been sitting on my computer for like three weeks now, and I'm, I'm like, I just got to get it out. So thank you so much for pressing play, and our next episode, we're going to be talking about Jesus and today's world. It's going to be a good one, and then you can keep an eye out for an episode on attachment theory. And we're going to start diving into some really fun topics, and so I can't wait. So thanks again for pressing play, and thanks for stepping into a real and honest conversation. And until next time, keep seeking.